Well, cool. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Good. 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 Great. Excellent. I mean, after lunch is like, I don't know which is better or worse, so before lunch or after lunch. Before lunch, everybody's like dying to get out and they want to go eat. After lunch, everybody's like, man, I just ate all I can eat. So, uh, uh, so I'm going to do my best to keep you awake. That's all I can say. I uh, appreciate you guys being here. Welcome to B-Sites Kansas City. If no one said that to you, let me be the first. It's awesome to be here. I'm excited to be here for the first time. So, let's dive on in. Did I already lose track of things? I think so. We're going to go back to this. I know why this isn't going. All right, so, much better. There we go. That's what I want to see. It's always good when I can fix the problems fast. The infamous, much maligned, much discussed, much scrutinized, probably most well-known aircraft in the world at this point, the 737 MAX Siemens. How many of you, five years ago, could honestly say you had heard of a 737 MAX C? Maybe a handful, a few more. How many of you have heard of it now? Yeah. The whole room. Yeah, there's been a lot of, obviously, media coverage about this, right? A lot of challenges, a lot of problems, a lot of criticism of Boeing, the FAA. The, actually, I don't think anyone's criticized the NTSB yet. They're probably the ones who got out of this squeaky clean. Let's start it. Nah, I like that. I kind of like the NTSB, so we'll leave it there. But, you know, man. You look at this situation, it's just like, what can we learn from this, right? Obviously, in the aviation world, that's what they always try to figure out. What can we learn from this? But I started thinking about this, and like, man, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that we can take away from this from a cybersecurity perspective. But as you look at the things that have gone wrong with this series of aircraft, all the challenges that they've had, it's uncanny how much of it just comes back to not really understanding the human element. So that seemed like a perfect opportunity to talk about the human element in cybersecurity. So before we get started, a little bit about me and a uh, disclaimer too. Uh, first and foremost, wow, that is going to be really small for y'all to see, but that's okay. Who I am, I'm a hacker. I'm a CISO. I'm an author. I'm a speaker, clearly. Um, this is just what I do. I've been in technology for 27 years. I started as a developer. Okay, I, I love getting out in the community, talking to people, sharing my insane ideas about things, and hearing other people either tell me why they're crazy, or why they like them, or what ideas they have. Um, I did write a book, Cybersecurity Career Guide, uh, that was 2022, so that's out there, and that's why we have the author part there. Um, this is the other part. This is why I'm up here using aviation as a metaphor in cybersecurity. I'm a private pilot. Uh, it's something I dreamed of doing all my life. A few years ago, I finally made it a reality. I also then fly an airplane and then fly all over the place. So I'm a private pilot. I'm instrument rated, which just means I can fly through the clouds or I can go up above 18,000 feet if I actually had an aircraft capable of that. Um, ASEL, what does that mean? Aircraft single engine land. So at this moment, I can only fly airplanes. I can only fly them if they have a single engine, and I can only fly them if they're capable of landing on the ground. So seaplanes, that kind of thing, not so much. Now, who I am not. I am, first of all, not an aviation engineer or any type of engineer at all. All right. So as far as the things I'm going to describe to you today, that's my level of expertise. I am not a flight instructor, so I'm going to give you lots of information. This is none of this, this flight instruction or anything that you should use in that sense. You might come out of here with some understandings of new things. That's great. I love it. That's what I'm hoping for. Hopefully, for sure, you come out of here with some understandings and new perspectives on cybersecurity. I am also not a representative, nor am I a fan of Boeing, the NTSB, or the FAA. I work with all of those organizations, well, the lab, the lab or two organizations. I don't work with Boeing at all. I don't know what a Boeing I don't think. But, um, yeah, so this is not to bash Boeing. This is not to praise Boeing. This is not to make excuses or anything like that for any of these parties. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into some definitions. Now, I am not going to stand up here and teach you a whole bunch about aviation. The goal here is to talk cybersecurity. It's a cybersecurity conference. That's what I'm here for. But I'm going to give you some wildly 
oversimplified definitions of a few terms that were are going to be important later in the presentation just to understand a few things. So again, you know, if you're a pilot and you see this and you're like, well, that is not really, don't give me the butt actually, I know. All right, there's a lot of butt actuallys. There's a lot of like, that's not totally correct. For purposes of this presentation, it will help. So the first one we're going to talk about is pitch. When we talk about an airplane, we talk about its attitude. And when we talk about its attitude, we are not talking about its motion in any way, shape, or form. We are simply talking about how is it positioned on three axes. There's pitch, there's roll, and there's yaw. That's it, okay? It has nothing to do with its actual motion through space. And that'll be important later, you'll see why. But so now, all you need to really think about is pitch is just, where is that, the nose of the aircraft? Is it angled up, is it angled down, or is it fall? That's pitch. All right? The second one is the angle of attack. Now, if you guys have been paying attention to the Max 8 the crashes a few years ago, Angle of attack is something that came up a lot. So what is angle of attack? This is where pitch becomes important. So angle of attack refers to the angle between the wings, which will change with the pitch of the airplane, and the wind that's flowing across them. Okay, so it's not the pitch itself. It's the angle between, you know, because it is totally normal for a plane to be flying like this. All right, so obviously the wind is going this way, but the plane is pitched up. <laughs> so that's what we mean when we talk about angle and attack. And that can change for a variety of reasons. And then finally, a stall. The reason I put this one up here is it's going to come up, but also there's probably one of the most misunderstood terms. I cannot tell you how many times the NTSB has told a news reporter that the plane stalled and they said, oh, the engine stopped. No, ain't wrong answer. Stall is an aerodynamic condition. All it means is that that angle of attack got too steep, whereas you can see here on the far right, that third picture, the air started to burble or cavitate over the top of the wing. That causes the wing to lose lift in the plane. descends. because hopefully lift is a term we all understand. That's what keeps the airplane in the air. So those are three things. Now, that's it. I'm, Master class on aviation. Uh, so let's dive into this. Let's talk about the 737. All right. So to start things off, let's, the 737 has been around since 1967. Was the first one. It was actually flown by a, a commercial airline. This is the 737-100, the very first. All right. What I'm going to call your attention to, and I know the picture is kind of small. So is the engine. On that. You can see the engines on these wings, they're fairly small. Okay? They were a Rolls Royce, what we call low bypass. That's not important what that means, just know that low bypass means it's little. Okay, it's why it's got a small opening in the front. That's all you need to know. Well, most aircraft now come with what we call high bypass jet engines. So when they did this with the 737, that's a Dash 300 series. So it's still 737, just a newer model. Think of it like a punk release. Some of you might have seen this on 737s before, where you see like the engine is shaped with the bottom flattened out. Okay, they did that because you can see how low this plane sits to the ground. They literally had to do that for ground clearance. So they shrunk the size of that cowling, or what we call the nacelle, and that they also had to push the engine a little further forward on the wing. You can kind of see that where a good portion of the engine is out in front of the wing. Okay, so this is just natural evolution, bigger, more powerful engine. It's also a little more efficient because it's more powerful. That's what the large bypass gives us. Well, with the 737 MAX series, they went bigger still. And if you look at this really cool scene, I know they're kind of small. Two things you'll notice. One, they're definitely bigger. This is the GE Leap engine. It's the biggest, baddest, most fuel-efficient one they've got to date. And they had to push it even further forward on the wing because to bring it back any farther, we would have had to move lower into the ground and then we would have had, again, ground clearance problems. Yeah. So why do I tell you all of this? Well, this feeds into the whole story of the MAX 8. Now, each time any aircraft maker wants to make a new airplane, 
they have to go through years long, very super duper expensive certification process. But if you just do a point release, on a plane, you, you create a newer version of it, you don't have to go through that same, but there's there's thresholds to what is the considered the same versus what is new, all right? So when they went with the 737 MAX <coughs> and the MAX 9 series, the goal was to create a bigger plane that was the same as the 737. Now this very re various reasons, you could say cost cutting maybe, but there also is one airline who has built their entire business model off of flying only 737s. Do you all know who that is? Southwest. Southwest. It's the only airplane they fly. Why do they do this? Because they can. They don't have to train their pilots on the same aircraft. So any pilot at Southwest can fly any Southwest airplane. It's not the case if you're a Delta pilot. You may be certified in the 757 and the 767. Well, you can't go fly an Embraer. Okay, but they have all those different planes. So between that and then some parts commonality, that's why Southwest did this. So now we start to get into the connection to cybersecurity. Let's talk about what some people were saying in that moment. This was after the Lion Air crash. A lot of people were talking about, well, you know, 737 Max 8, they made all these changes and they made lots of decisions to to you know, keep it the same just because they didn't want to go through the cost of that, you know, that certification cycle. I know it's not really true. They're meeting customer needs. They have this big customer, Southwest Airlines, who said, we need a bigger 737, but it has to be a 737 because we don't want to introduce a new aircraft to our line. We don't want to have to retrain all of our pilots and now have this scheduling nightmare of you know, this pilot or this crew didn't make it, and now we don't have a pilot because we don't have someone certified, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so what's going on here that we do in cybersecurity? It's that lack of understanding of who our users are, why they do the things they do, all right? How many times have you ever heard that? You know, the, the user's your weakest link, or you know, our devs are lazy, they just don't care. Our executives, Hi, yeah, they just don't give a shit about cybersecurity. We've all heard that before, right? So a lot of times that happens in cybersecurity. We have that tendency to jump to conclusions and assume the worst motives rather than taking a step back and saying, why? Why are they doing the things they're doing? And how do I influence them to do it differently? And maybe, just maybe, they actually have good intentions. Maybe they're trying to do the right things to, you know, make the company money so we all stay employed. So how do we combat that? It's with empathy. <clears throat> this is something we unfortunately seem to lack still in cybersecurity. And when I say empathy, I'm talking about just understanding them, right? It's listening to them. When you're talking about a, a design of a software system, are you actually listening to why they're doing things the way they are? Or are you immediately formulating your head the argument, why you can't do it that way, or that's bad, or you're just being lazy, or just rushing them. You know, actually listening, understanding, and honestly, having the insight to see that, you know what, their priorities and motives are different than ours. It doesn't make them any more or less valid than any of ours. At the end of the day, if you work in a company, or you work for a nonprofit, or you work for an agency of the government, we're all there to make those organizations successful in some way, whether it's profit, whether it's the mission, whatever. That's all of our goals. We all play a part in that. We all have different components that feed that. And so that's something we need to recognize from a cybersecurity perspective because it is the core of everything else I'm going to talk about. It's the core of how you build out a truly credible and effective cybersecurity program. So... Automation. Let's talk about automation, right? Automation is really great until it's not. And where that applies in the 737 world, how many of you have heard of MCAS? Most of you now because it was all over the news. MCAS, first of all, was introduced to the 737 MAX series. That is not the first aircraft to use it. Actually, the KC-46 is another common example where they took a 767 and converted for military use and they had to create this thing. So what is MCAS? 
MCAS is just a computer-driven system that, as the name would imply, augments control pressures in the aircraft. So it notices the airplane doing something, and it, it adds pressure to what the pilot feels in the air. And that's a common practice. That's not just MCAS. Everything, even on Boeings with their big yokes, you know, everything's Airbus with a little side stick, yeah, it's fly-by-wire. Even the Boeings, there's a certain amount of manipulation of just what that control feels like by systems on the plane that have nothing to do with what's actually happening in the back of the <laughs> MCAS was brought about in 737 for one reason, and this is why I talked about those engines. When they brought those engines forward, what they discovered was at a high rate of velocity and with a significant amount of pitch, the nacelle around that aircraft actually created its own lift, which then caused the nose to pitch even more. And that's not a behavior you want. And it has to do with where they position the, those engines that far forward, the thrust, a whole lot of factors. So they introduced MCADs to tone that down. And then they started to realize it also happened in lower speed situations too, so they had to reprogram MCADs. But MCADs uses that thing on the right, that is the infamous angle of attack sensor. It is what tells the computer how pitched up is really the wing compared to the wind that's passing by. Now, contrary to what some people understood, every 737 MAX has two windows. It's how they were used that was where there was this thing about, you know, they only use one or the other. We'll talk more about that later. We actually always use both, but that's in the first story. We'll get there later. So, where does that happen in cybersecurity? I think we can all talk about stories, probably, of cases where an over-reliance on automation hurt, right? This story from Microsoft, where they had a massive outage in one of their regions. Why? Because the power blip took out all the automation and the few workers that they had, because we don't need all the workers because of the automation, didn't know how to recover from it, or didn't have the capability to recover from it. And that's the problem when we look at cybersecurity, we start thinking about automation. Automation is great until it breaks, and then who's there to fix it? Well, you better have some humans still standing there. So all this talk about AI and everybody's worried about their jobs. <coughs> You gotta learn new skills, but your job isn't going anywhere. So what do we do about this? We have to remember ultimately what we're trying to build in a cybersecurity program is a security enabled culture. And I stress the enabled piece of that. Do we have people who feel enabled, allowed to go out and actually make a cybersecurity decision in the moment? Do we have processes? Do we have governance that fosters that? All of these elements, technology, people, tools, processes, governance is the one that you can't read in dark purple at the bottom, because I know it's a dirty word we all hate. Oh, I'm kidding. Where are my GRC folks? Okay, the ones are going to keep my ass after this. <laughs> we love governance. I love governance anyway. Mm. Governance is necessary. It's all a part of the system that makes it work. We can't count on automation of technology alone to get us through the day. It's not going to work. And we have to understand how the people are going to react, how they're going to work within our processes. So our automation needs to take that into account. Just like you really wish MCAS might have done a better job on the early 737 MAX. Let's talk about training. Oh, God, you guys aren't going to be able to read this. It's so funny. So. The, the big part you can probably read, right? Boeing CEO admits they didn't train pilots on MCATs. You may have heard about this in the news after some of those crashes. Well, what you can't read back there is this last bullet here. Why didn't they? Well, because it's fundamentally embedded in the handling qualities of the airplane. So when you train on the airplane, you're being trained on MCATs. Yeah. Or the answer. We proved that. We crashed two of them. Oh, 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 no. That's a bad assumption. But we do the same thing in cybersecurity. Can't really see it, but this is a great proof point template. This is what they brag about. Oh, we we have 80% click-through rate when we release this to our customers. They were 80%. Is that a good thing, first of all? 
Why are you bragging about that? Um, okay, I guess, yeah, you're highlighting some issues. But then what do we do when we do these fishing tests? Well, we release the report, right? Here's the graph of how many people click through. Let me ask you a question. <laughs> when it comes to an attacker trying to fish your people, do you care how many of those people clicked on some contrived idea you had of what an attacker might do? No. What you care about is did one person who was super busy and maybe not paying attention, or who was thinking, who I'm going to get free Netflix for a month, or whatever, get duped into clicking on an attack you didn't think about. Right? That's what we care about. So, and then of course, you know, after we do all this, we were awfully like, ooh, it's cybersecurity awareness month. It's October. Yay! We think about cybersecurity for one month of the year, and after that, you guys can forget about it. <laughs> These aren't effective trading techniques. Now, I get it, okay? I do phishing simulations in my organization, partially because I'm forced to by <coughs> those governance people. Uh, <laughs> PCI is going to PCI. I'm just. I, that's what I'm saying, right? It's all about PCI or every other compliance thing that forces you to do this. So we do it. But there are ways to handle this better. And what is that? We have to train for outcomes, not actions. Did we just lose the mic? I think we did. I was going to say, hey. I think that went quiet. Dead battery. It literally says it with an exclamation point. It's perfect error, but we're going to talk about error messages. This is actually good. I wish we were on the pump. We're not quite there yet. But let's. This is the I can go to that. See now, if I was in my airplane, I have so many spare batteries. Uh, no, that's all right. We'll just go around. We'll go with this for the rest of the week. That's cool. So yeah, <laughs> dead battery. I mean, bright as day. That was awesome. Oh um, yeah, if I was in my plane, we would have spares. I carry a lot of spare batteries in my bags. All right. So what do we do with all this information? How do we train people? We need to train for outcomes. The problem is, you think about these fishing tests. What do we do? We're training for an action, right? What do we want to see them do? I give you a phishing simulation. What's the best outcome? What, or what, what is the best action that we expect in a phishing campaign? Report. 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 Well, what do we want the user? What are we what action are we looking for from the user? It's our best one. Oh, to report it to us. Yeah. Right? They click the phishing button or they click report as phishing or whatever you've got. Maybe you've got Lotus Notes. Okay. Please tell me. Uh, Does anybody actually have Lotus Notes anymore? I hope not. Oh crap! There's a no. no. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> uh, any <laughs> sidetrack. Do you notice how fast it's like? <laughs> um, no, we need to be training for outcomes. What are the outcomes we want? The outcomes are we want them to recognize when something doesn't feel right. We want them to recognize that. Email is inherently not really the most trustworthy system, cool. right? We want them to be communicative with us. I don't care if you click the button. I don't care if you delete it and say nothing. I don't care if you forward it to me and say, is this thing real? I don't care if you call that person who just sent you that email and say, did you really send me this crap? Right? There's a hundred different ways that you can respond effectively to a phishing email. Any of them are good, so as long as they aren't, I'm going to click the link and put my creds in and see what happens. Yeah. Right? So we have to be training for those outcomes. And then here's the key. So how do we make, how do I take a phishing simulation that I'm forced to do, actually mostly by my customers, not even regulations. Mm. Yeah. No. Um, we can talk after. No, no. Um, <laughs> How do I make that useful? Because I'll guarantee you, yes, I run the reports like everybody else. How many do we hit? You know, it's that review, that last little bit here. I don't care if you clicked or not. I don't care if you deleted or not. Everybody in the company, when we're done with a phishing simulation, gets information about what could you learn from this email. What was here? What were ways you could have handled this? I'm not going to come chasing you. Somebody, unfortunately, in my organization will come chasing you, make you go to training, trying to get them away from that. 
Mm -hmm. I got them to stop with the three strikes rule, by the way. Please get that toxicity out of your culture. Again, you want them to communicate to you. So if you say, hey, if you click three times, you're fired. Well, they're just, they're not going to talk to you, right? I mean, and they're going to hope they don't get caught. I want them telling me, oh, shit, Alyssa, I just clicked on this thing. Are we in trouble? Did you put your credits in? No? Okay, you're good. Right? That's what we care about. So think about outcomes-based education. All right. Now. Let's talk about failure modes for a minute. So, the Lion Air crash, which is one of the two actual crashes from the MCAS system. One of the things they found in the cockpit voice recorder that surprised people was how long it took them to figure out how to turn this thing off, and then after they did, they turned it back on. Okay, so this thing you weren't trained in, you turned it off successfully, got control of the aircraft, then you turned it back on, lost control of the aircraft. So the problem here is these two little switches that are on the left, I guess. Yeah, because of course that's the same. They're on the left side, right? You see them circled there. They're tiny. Okay, but the, what those two little switches do is they turn off the MCAS system, but they don't just turn off the MCAS system. They turn off something that every pilot and every aircraft from the minute you get in your very first Cessna learns about, and that's what this wheel's for, it's called trim. And what that does is that is a way a pilot controls how much pressure there is on the control yoke so that, you know, basically the goal being I adjust that so I can just let go of the control yoke and the plane will stay level. Okay, that, that's literally what it's there for. There's a lot more complexity to it, but don't worry about that. So the, the failure mode here, what they were supposed to do was turn off those two switches. Now they lose not only the MCAS system, which stops it from you know, trying to crash them, but it means now they have to trim the aircraft by hand. Now, if you've ever paid attention to 737 when the doors open before you know they close everything, you might see those little wheels there and they spin around and around and around. They make a weird noise. Well, most of the time that's controlled electronically. They have just a little switch on the control yoke. But when you turn it off, you have to pop out that little handle you see there on the right, and you have to crank that thing. Okay, now imagine you're trying to control this plane that's fighting you. It's trying to dive, and you're trying to pull it back, and you're trying to crank this trim to get the, the surfaces to behave the way you want them to. Well, what ended up happening was they weren't able to use the manual trim at all. They didn't know about the MCAS system because, as we talked about before, they weren't trained. So they turned the electric trim back on, even though their checklist told them not to. Because it was so complex, they couldn't do all the things they needed to do that they felt to get control of the plane. They didn't know that, you know, when they turned this thing back on, the plane was just going to dive harder. But that's what ended up happening. And that is what ended up leading to that crash. Now, there's a lot more, but that's it. But let's talk about the complexity of our security controls, right? Because we do the same thing to our people. You've got, you know, hey, you know, patch your shit. It's easy. That's what CISA tells us. Just patch your shit. And I'm not picking on CISA. I actually liked them. But they did say that for a while, right? I mean, that was basically their campaign, patch your stuff. But then you hand them a vulnerability report that's got 7,000 findings on it. You can't just go patch your shit. Oh, yeah, I'll tell them, let me know. I'll get to that next year, right? I mean, that's the response we get, and understandably so. Um, you can't see it at all. I wish you could, but the, the next one on the right side, that's a one single screen in Entra ID. How many of you are Azure customers using Entra ID? I see all the thumbs down. That is the most complex set of permissions and rules, and oh my God, I was, I was just telling somebody, I. I all day Friday, as a CISO, I'm sitting there going through and reading through conditional access policies. What a nightmare. And then we expect users to be able to do the same. People who aren't cybersecurity professionals are supposed to be able to hand that to an IT person, or God forbid, someone in your DevOps pipeline is supposed to manage that hey. stuff. They're not allowed. <laughs> not allowed. <laughs> Nobody should be allowed. It's a mess. It's so hard to understand. And then we create these gigantic frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK. <sighs> what? Come on. So we have to be thinking about our users and how do we simplify that? Now, I, I saw this. Okay, so first of all, I use the term continuous improvement with my teams. <laughs> 
a ton. Incremental improvements, I say it all the time, they are so sick of hearing it. But then I saw this picture and it, it really brought home what those phrases mean to me. I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually a 3D printed sign, okay? And it, it starts at relentless where the very top of it is just maybe one or two filaments thick and it grows and grows and grows. You think about how a 3D printer works, that's how we have to be thinking about our cybersecurity programs. Too often we go chasing after that last layer, the improvement, where it's now, you know, they probably a few thousand passes thick. And we spend so much time chasing that, we don't just start making little progress. What is the one thing I can tackle today that's going to make us a little more safe tomorrow? And when you do that, that's where we get that whole concept of like paralysis, or yeah, paralysis by analysis, or you know, it, it, all that complexity just drives in act, in action. People don't react; they don't do the things we want them to do when we overcomplicate, complicate it, and make it feel onerous and awful and terrible. Our developers tell us, "You're nuts if you think I'm going through a forty thousand finding Veracode report," and they're right. Would you read through 40,000 Veracode lines? I ain't going to the heck with that. So, I mean, that, these are the things we're talking about. I'm not picking up Veracode either, okay? All, every SAS tool I've ever worked with does the same crap. So, we need to think about our cybersecurity programs that way. All right, now let's talk about assumptions of behaviors and error messages, because it was so convenient that we had the dead battery error message. <laughs> All right, so there's a few things going on on this slide. What you see on the right is what we call a stick shaker. Remember I talked about the stall before? Stall is probably one of the most common ways that airplanes crash, especially little airplanes, but bigger ones too. You get in a condition for whatever reason where you don't have enough airflow over the wings and it's doing that cavitation verbally thing and the plane loses and it goes into a spin and bad things happen. Planes literally fall out of the sky. That stick shaker is there in larger aircraft to let the pilot know, yo, you're about to stall. And all it does is it literally just shakes the control yoke. So that's what it's mounted to. It's literally just a vibration unit attached to the control yoke. And when you get near a stall, it shakes it. Because in a smaller airplane, that happens naturally. When you get close to the stall, the plane buffets, as they call it, and you feel it. So it's there, and tr pilots are trained over and over relentlessly from your very first training session in the smallest little Cessna, your student pilot looking to get your private pilot, all the way up to your semi-annual recurrent training as an air transport pilot flying for the airlines. We're all taught the plane is starting to buffet or stall, you push the nose down. Okay? It's a simple thing. Your angle of attack's too high, push the nose down. You're gonna restore airflow, the plane will stay flying. Now I mentioned before, we have these two angle of attack sensors in the airplane, right, that tell the pilot what's going on with that, where my angle of attack is. The MCAS system is watching that, that stick shaker is also watching that. So what happens when you have MCAS plus a stick shaker plus a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor that says you're pitched way up, well, three things. MCAS, as we found out, says, hey, nose down. Come on, bring it down. And it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going. Meanwhile, the pilots have the stick shaker going off, and the plane is screaming at them that they're stalling. What does the pilot do when your response to a stall is to push the stick forward, but the plane is already diving and you're trying to pull it back? And this led to what you can't see in the upper right there is the title of the report from the NTSB talking about the assumptions, the faulty assumptions that were made about the pilot behaviors here. And it's, you know, it was assumed that the pilots would understand you know, a stick shaker and do the right thing and they train on that. But it was never thought about what happens when MCAS malfunctions the other direction and pushes this thing down. And meanwhile, you've got that stick shaker going. Now, a quick sidebar. 
you guys have probably heard, I said before that there were two AOAs sensors on every, every 737. There was misinformation out there about a feature that was missing or it was optional. It wasn't the sensor. What it was was that little guy right up there at the top, which is an indicator of what is the active angle of attack sensor reading. Okay, that was the optional feature. And honestly, you can debate whether you actually need that or not. Now, the problem came in that with that also came this little bit at the bottom. And Boeing claims this was unintentional, it wasn't supposed to be. You had to have that optional feature at the top to also get this alert at the bottom. That alert at the bottom is what told you when one angle of attack sensor said you were pitched way up and the other said, now nah, you're flying level. That might have helped, but then again, without having trained them on the MCAS system, I don't know how you expect them to know that that mismatch is suddenly feeding what's going on in the plane. So, but how does that pertain to cybersecurity? Well, I'm going to have to read another one to you because these are so little. I didn't realize the screens are going to be this small. But that top one is my favorite. How many of you have seen these, these banners like this in Outlook? So let me read them to you. The top one says, the sender of this email cannot be validated and may not match the person in the front field. Okay. I understand that. Then the next message says, this email originated from outside the organization. Do not click on links or open attachments unless you recognize the sender. <laughs> the fuck? You just can't even know what the sender is. I'm supposed to figure it out now? But that's what we do. And then below it, you see, you know, what else do we do? Always use MFA, MFA everywhere. Put it on everything. It's like that hot sauce. I'll put that shit on everything. <laughs> but then we come back and we say, well, wait, how much MFA is too much MFA? Because now we have MFA fatigue. Crying out loud. I mean, we can't expect user success in these moments when this is how we do things. <laughs> Literally. Well, if you don't trust the sender, you already told me you don't trust them. Why would I? <laughs> How am I supposed to know if I trust them or not? You just sent me an email that says, well, maybe this didn't come from who it says it came from. Couldn't we simplify that a little bit? Hey, maybe you should call the person that this seems to have come from and find out if they sent it to you. That would be a much easier to understand message. But that's not what we do. Now, the way... Where this all stems from, both in the 737 and those error messages, is we don't really think about failure modes the way we should. You know, maybe if we do really good threat modeling, we'll sit there and actually walk through a failure from top to bottom and consider all of the systems within that interact with whatever system just failed. More often than not, we don't sit down and talk about that. Anyone who's seen me talk about threat modeling, that's threat modeling right there. We all do it every day. What could possibly go wrong? That's all it is. It's asking that question. And then it's, if you really want to do this and understand failure modes, it's sitting down with all those people and talking about, well, what would happen if? How would your system respond? Well, if the AOA sensor goes bonkers on one side, how is MCAS going to respond? What's that going to do with the stick shaker? What's it going to show on the primary flight display? These are the things you have to walk through. What's going to happen if, you know, suddenly Entra, because we'll pick on them some more, we stop getting sign-in alerts. Is that happening to anybody, by the way, who's got Microsoft? Have you seen problems with sign-in logs? If so, talk to me after. we got some chatting to do. But what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the sim? What's Defender going to do? What is our IAM process going to do? How are all those systems going to react? What's it going to look like? What weird indications might we see that aren't going to match up to a simple answer of what the problem is? Think about that in terms of, the, of incident response for a minute. The system goes offline for some reason. What's that going to look like to us? How's that? How are we going to respond? How are we going to know that Oh, that may have just been hit with rain somewhere. Are our error messages really going to tell us that? Or is there a specific set of behaviors we might need to identify that we haven't really talked about? So when we think about tabletops, it has to be more than just make sure everybody gets in the room together, they call the right people, they react, and we send the right communications. Those are all really good. 
You have to do that. But also, tabletop, just what is it going to actually look like if that cool scenario you came up with for your tabletop actually happened? What would that actually look like? And unfortunately, most of the tabletops I've been to, people don't do that. It's, we make a lot of assumptions. We discovered this thing. Well, how the hell did we discover it? What happened? What did it do? So think about that as you're scheduling your tabletops. How can you bring that discipline in? All right. Everybody know what this is? What is this? It's a door plug. It is not a plug door. Did we learn what the difference is between these two, by the way? Yeah. The plug door is the real door that you walk through. The door plug is this thing that you put in there when there isn't a door. All right? So obviously now we've switched gears. We've gone from our MCAS-induced crashes to the infamous Alaska Airlines 737 MAX 9 that the door just decided to depart. <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. I'm out. So, what's interesting here is notice the title, A Failed Handoff. I think a lot of us have heard ad nauseum about the relationship between Spirit Aviation, and it's not the airline. <laughs> Spirit Airlines, that's someone else. They fly the big, you know, school bus looking things. Spirit Aerospace. Get the right name. Spirit Aerospace and Boeing, right? Spirit Aerospace puts these fuselages together. They have people who literally do all the riveting and all the things. They put it all together. All the different panels and parts go on. They then ship that fuselage from... Kansas. Yep. There we go. Wait, I got... Come on, I'm, at, I'm in Kansas City. No one's going to yell out. Come on. They come from Kansas. And I'm not picking on Kansas. I'm picking on Spirit. Not really. But they slowly ship them. They get to Boeing and they find out, you know, that Boeing starts building. Now, there are, believe it or not, and despite what the media is telling you, there are actually quality controls in place. <coughs> However, they were finding out that there were so many problems with quality that they actually had sp aeros uh, spirit aerospace engineers embedded at Boeing out in Seattle who were fixing when they screwed things up. So the story, what we actually know at this point, now we don't know everything, that's the actual plug door, or a door plug that popped out, okay? And there's little blue circles on there that show the bolts that are supposed to just keep the door from sliding up so that it can then pop off were not there. And what actually happened here is that this plane was identified by Boeing as having a failure. There was a problem. There was a problem with 47 rivets around this door. So what they had to do is they had to remove the door. Well, they didn't remove the door. They opened the door or the door plug. And this is where things get fun because there is two ways you can deal with this. You can either open it or you can remove it. If you remove it, it requires a whole lengthy set of inspections. But if you open it, it's like you opened any other door plug or any other plug door. See, this is so confusing. It's like you open any other plug door, which obviously is a normal operation. It happens hundreds of times a month. And therefore, there's not an inspection required. Now, what this really comes down to is there was a mismatch between the spirit system that was used to track these things and the Boeing one. So when spirit marked it, we opened the door plug to make the repair. It didn't trigger Boeing to say, oh, we need to reinspect that door when it's done. So when they failed to put the bolts in, bad things happened. So where does this happen? We have systems that don't communicate all the time, right? Our sims aren't getting information the way they're supposed to be. And we run into these same things. So how do we tackle that? Well, sometimes integration can actually be more important than your capability. Now, I've been picking on Microsoft for people that would say this. Microsoft may not be the best of breed of anything, but when you put all that shit together, wow, does it let you do some really crazy cool stuff because it's all integrated. Everything is there together. Now, I could say the same with many other people that are quite familiar with vendors who might be sponsoring this conference. Um, <laughs> I gotta put in a little plug because she's sitting up here. Um, but no, I mean Cisco, same thing. I know evil, evil words.
But sometimes when we're looking at products, instead of always being about what's hanging in, what's in that upper right quadrant and partner, maybe we should just be looking at what do you integrate with? How do you integrate with my different systems? Do you have an existing integration built? Or is this something that we have to spawn ourselves? Because that can make every bit of difference. Now, let's talk about a little bit of good news. If you all heard the audio from the Alaska Airlines flight, you know that that pilot, man, she was dead calm. I don't know how. <laughs> but, I mean, the door blew open, her headset blew off, there's a hole in the back of the plane, they don't know what's going on, everybody's got their little masks on, you know, the, the rubber jungle as they call it, well, the masks fall. So, and obviously the other pilot was equally calm because in 20 minutes they were down below 10,000 feet and then back onto the ground. That's awesome. They reacted almost instantaneously, by the way. When this happened, and they're, they're, again, things they're trained to do. But the key thing, you're at 16,000 feet, everything goes to hell, masks around, the jungles down. You gotta get below 10,000 feet where everyone can breathe again. They did that in less than a minute. That's how quickly they reacted. Like I said, within 20 minutes, they were on the ground. And the radio calls from I, the first officer, I believe, I they haven't really said for sure, uh, whether she was flying, I mean, it sounds like if she was on the radio, she probably wasn't. He, the other pilot was probably flying. Don't know who was who, but in any event, awesome stuff. The reality is, with all this AI and everything else, the good news is the human element is still our best weapon. I don't give a shit who out there wants to scream and yell about the human element being the weakest link, blah, 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 blah. It's the human element that brings us intuition. This just doesn't smell right. Something's wrong. You don't get that from an AI. We have perceptual flexibility. We can intake different inputs that are, look very different but mean the same thing, and we can make those connections. And adaptive cognition, what do I mean by that? Well, what I'm talking about here is literally making those decisions that are in your own best interest and being able to adapt those based on what it is that you're perceiving. Those are things we don't get from AI today. We may, I'm not going to say never, but it could be a very long road before we do ever get there. This is what the human element brings us. So we ultimately, now, hey, we've moved away from 737s for a minute because that's an Airbus. <laughs> Spoiler. But you all know this one too, right? Sully landing that thing in the Hudson River. We have to recognize that at the end of the day, it's going to take individual expertise and heroics to get us through. Whether we're talking about an incident response, whether we're talking about building out our cybersecurity infrastructure, whatever it is, that's not something to be avoided. That's something to be embraced and leveraged and used every step of the way. Now, we don't want it locked into an individual, but we want to make use of that. That's why we hire really incredibly smart, super talented people. And then finally, the causation versus shame. If you guys don't know the relationship between the NTSB and the FAA, the NTSB goes out and they research facts. They don't use names. They don't talk about blame. They look specifically for what the hell happened and how can we learn from it. The FAA, our regulating body, loves to blame, as they are right now with Boeing. And to be fair, they're also giving the Airbus a whole lot of crap because in all this mess of Boeing, what we didn't hear about was Airbuses where one engine would just shut down mid-flight. Does that sound scary? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. The point is, these things happen in a very you know, minor, minor, minor percentage of the time, but they do happen. And that's why we have trained pilots to deal with it. But anyway, the point is, when we go with blame, we don't learn. And it's the same thing in cybersecurity. How can we go about sharing this information. And it's hard, especially when it comes to breaches, because nobody wants to talk about it because the lawyers tell us not to. I work for a company in the legal industry, all right? So plug for CISA, the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative is one way we're breaking through this. The other is, hey, you know, how can we learn from our instance and how are we reporting on what we can learn from them? Last thing I'm gonna talk about, because I promised I would, the Swiss cheese model, who's heard of this? How do we apply it in cybersecurity? What's the most prominent place we claim we use Swiss cheese model? Defense in depth. Defense in depth is what it actually should be, but where do we actually see Swiss cheese model talked about? 
when people talk about the American tech framework, oh. that's applying it wrong. When I talk about the Swiss cheese model, and the NTSB does this all the time, it's what are the failures that we had that led to this happening? It's not what did the attacker do, and let's find that step in the cyber kill chain. <laughs> We can't predict what attackers are going to do. We've tried that for 25 years. I've been doing this and we fail. We need to be focusing on what mistakes are we making and how do we stop those holes from aligning that then lets the attacker in. So I'm going to leave you with a quick quote from Sully because I love this one because it talks about that pilots are taught to always have situational awareness, to have that mental picture of what's happening. It's a great idea, and when it fails, it fails miserably. Like when we give them all sorts of crazy messages that don't mean anything, or they're being told they're stalling while they're nose down, right? These are the things that we need to be working on, and it takes that human element to be able to overcome those sometimes. So with that, uh, quickly, I'll throw this up here just for the moment, because um, I know I'm running a couple minutes over. I apologize. Um, if you need, want to contact me, please do. I'm always happy to talk security, talk aviation. The YouTube link at the top, I have both. I have security content out there. I've got aviation content out there. Happy to talk to you guys anytime with that. Thank you all so much. And most importantly, thank you to all of our amazing sponsors who made sure we could all be here today and have this fun. Hey.